Welcome everyone. Shabbat Shalom. I'm Steve Blum. I'm the president of the Birmingham Temple. Uh, my wife Stephanie is on the board of the SHJ here with her team celebrating the 50th anniversary of the SHJ. So welcome to our guests. My two children, Ryan and Rebecca, are in the Post Mitzvah program, which is a component of the Birmingham Temple's Spinoza Youth Education Program. So our family is really happy to be part of the Birmingham Temple, welcoming you all here tonight. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. This is my official welcome to all of you to the Birmingham Temple and the words that we always forget to say. Congregation for Humanistic Judaism, because we're the first, we like to put that out there, very clear for everyone to know who we are in this community. It's a delight to have all of you here tonight. Uh, many of the things that you're going to be talking about are things that we are most concerned with. We heard a moment ago about the social justice. I want you to know that you're sitting in a sanctuary congregation, the first ever secular humanist organization to declare the sanctuary. I want you to know that the Birmingham Temple Congregation for Humanistic Judaism has been supporting a young Syrian mother and her four children whose father was deported for the last year and a half. And without us, it would not have happened that they would be able to stay in this country. And I want you to know that all of this grows out of our humanistic values. We live our values every single day here, as each and every one of you do at your congregations. We are so proud to be the first, but we are more proud of being one among many. So thank you for allowing us to host this. Welcome to all of you, and we'll begin. Our service tonight will feature readers from our movement, beginning with Rabbi Miriam Jarris, Rabbi Jody Kornfeld, the president of the Association of Humanistic Rabbis, Rabbi Eva Goldfinger, Mary Raskin, whom you met earlier, Richard Logan, the president of the society, and Rabbi Frank Tamborello. And we will begin with the first reading. Arthur. Oh, we're going to light candles. We're going to light candles. See, it's, it's a good thing I bring Miriam because she assists me in knowing what the next thing is to do in my job. So, uh, to light those candles, what say we have someone from the Society for Humanistic Judaism come up? Like Miriam Jarris and Paul Golan. And our special guest tonight, our honoree, who we'll be hearing from in a moment, Rachel Lasser from the Americans United for Separation of Church and State. an easy way to do this one. I know I'm ambient. There it is. Berochim Habaim, welcome and Shabbat Shalom. Please join me responsively. We gather on this Shabbat as a community of believers. We believe that Judaism is the entire experience of the Jewish people. We believe in the value of celebrating Jewish culture we believe that all those who choose to celebrate with us are part of our community. We believe that the Jewish strengthens and enhances our humanistic Jewish experience. May this Sabbath be a time of peace and rejuvenation. This is a time of transition. We move from our everyday week to the experience of Shabbat. 
we turn from the concerns <coughs> excuse me, of the outside world and become quiet and peaceful. We at the end of moment, in this time, create a community of humanistic Jewish believers. Let us pause and take note as we begin the journey of this Shabbat. Shabbat has always been a symbol of peace. Our ancestors called it a taste of the world to come. The peace that they sought to create on Shabbat teased them with hopes that such calm might one day prevail throughout the world. Perhaps it was just a fantasy, but it gave them comfort nonetheless. Today we understand that if we desire such a world, it must come through our own work. Perhaps Shabbat can remind us of that. Shabbat Shalom. May we all enjoy a Sabbath of peace. Righteousness and enlightenment shall be our torch. We shall live these values diligently. 
We shall teach these values diligently to our children all the days of our lives. We shall endeavor to live by these values in the comfort of our homes or on cold and windswept roads. Whether adversity bows our heads or fulfillment makes our spirits soar, our hands shall mete out justice to all and our eyes shall be open to the light of truth. We shall emblazon our paths through life with this light as a beacon for all humanity. These words we inscribe in our innermost heart. We aspire to practice them day and night, teaching them diligently to our children through our words and especially through our deeds, so that the next generations learn to review, revere, and celebrate life. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, 
neither shall they learn war anymore. The poet Yehuda Amachai wrote, don't stop after beating the swords into plowshares. Don't stop. Go on beating and make musical instruments out of them. Whoever wants to make war again, we'll have to turn them into plowshares first. <laughs> those who suffer pain of the body or spirit, those who are lonely, those who have been wronged. Tonight our well wishes are extended to these members of our community and their loved ones, to Lucille Arking, Russell Cruzan, C.J. Elephant, Joe Gaydon, Philip Kaplan, Joy Schumacher, and Susan Winchell. If there's someone whom you're thinking about whose name you'd like to share who is ill or in need of our well wishes, We'll begin up here on the balcony. Please raise your hand. Murray Spillman. In the back? Patty Holder. Anybody else up there? Down here on the right? Yes, Sandy. Alan Waxman. Jean. Betty Alou. Richard. Jennifer Kennedy Logan. Susan. Cheryl Brios. Did we miss anybody on this side here? In the back, anybody? Oh, Jeffrey. Shotzi Haber and Pam. Anybody in the back? Susanna Hoffman. Go ahead in the back. Norman Glickman. Thank you. And Andy? Yes, Aya Janik. Larry? So, so, so. You miss anybody else down here? There's somebody next to you. Oh, go ahead, just say the name. Susan Rubin. Thank you. Anybody over here? If I missed you, go ahead and say the name because the lights are in my eyes and I don't want anybody to be Susan missed. Susan Kandarian. Thank you. May all who suffer know that they are not alone. May they be healed quickly. May they experience a complete recovery before Ashlema, the renewal of their bodies and the renewal of their spirits. I started to make the call. 
Then I remembered. I got sick and I didn't know what to do. I started to make the call. Then I remembered. I forgot what that Yiddish expression meant. I started a call. Then I remembered. I wanted your recipe. I started to call. Then I remembered. Good news, bad news, wisdom and guidance. I start to make the calls, but then I remember, you aren't out there, you aren't going to answer, but you're in my heart, I'll always remember. Our thoughts turn to those who are no longer with us, our own loved ones, those whom our friends and neighbors have lost, the martyrs of our people whose graves are unmarked, and those of every people and nation whose lives have been a blessing to humanity. As we remember them, we meditate on the meaning of love and loss, of life and death. We recall now our loved ones whom death has recently taken from us, those who died at this season in years past, and those whom we've taken into our hearts with our own. Tonight, we mourn the recent death of Robert Seifer, son of Anne Seifer, and we observe the yard sites of William Eisen, Lawrence Altman, Arthur Harold Blumberg, Dorothy Bluestein, Sheldon Bobro, Rosalie Bieber Brown, Wallace Cherney, Julius Chupak, Max Ellen Bogan, Morris Caden, Dora Glass, Fanny Gorin, Isla Breyer Lederman, Celia Meisner, Jack Miller, Bruce Mumbrew, Rita Muroff, Paul Rose, Ralph Sarkis, Michael Scala, Richard Slade, Lydia Bandy Slachter, Ben Stowicki, Samuel Sugarman, and Andre Zador. Again, as we did earlier for those who are ill, if there's someone whom you're remembering whose name you'd like to add to our list, we'll begin here on the balcony. Anybody here? Yes. Cousin Lois Glass, who had died a week ago, and Riva Waslow, it's my mother's who it's like tonight. Anybody else up here? Yes. Sure. Anybody else? How about here? Yes, go ahead. Larry Runner. Sandy. Sherwin Wine. Anybody else on this thing, Eva? Tom Kennedy. Joseph and Oh, yes. Scott. 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 Anybody else on this thing? Pauline Riley. Thank you. And here? Rabbi Ed Kleins. Oh, yes. Paul yes. Older. Go ahead. Jack Harmon. Go ahead. Alan Kaplan. And yes, Jack Carol Cox. And in the back? Leah yeah, yeah. Williams. And sitting right in front there? Judy Dalmick. Okay. Anybody else here on the Ar balcony? Archie Krugman. It's my father's here. It's like... Thank you. Rob. Seth Blumberg. Bill Brinkman. Did we miss anybody here at all? The recent murders a week ago of uh, Christians <coughs> were. Thank you. And over here, anybody? Yes, sir. And anybody else? Did we miss? Yes, way in the back. Did we miss anybody at all? At this time, it is our custom that if you wish to light a candle for any of these people or anyone whose memory you honor, you are invited to join me on the demo.
insight, this humanistic interpretation of Kaddish together. Nit Gadal v'nit Kadash v'ruach ha'adam. Let us enhance and exalt ourselves in the spirit of humanity. Let us acclaim the preciousness of life. Let us show gratitude for life by approaching it with reverence. Let us embrace the whole world even as we wrestle with its parts. Let us each in our own way take up our share in serving the world and seeking truth. May our commitment to life help us to strengthen healing of spirit and peace of mind. May healing and peace permeate and comfort the house of Israel and all those who dwell on earth. And let us say, Ken Yehi, may it be so. Please be seated. Just a note for those of you who are here from our congregation about what's coming up. Next week we will be observing Yom HaShoah together and we will hear from Dr. Guy Stern, uh, who is from the Holocaust Memorial Center. He's going to talk about the Ritchie brothers. These were the fellows like him who were refugees from Germany as young men and went back to fight the Nazis. So I hope that those of you who are here will join us for that very important talk and that very special occasion. And now we continue with our program for the evening. I am given the great honor of introducing not our speaker, but our introducer. <laughs> And I'll take that honor, because it's a good one. We are so happy that Paul Golan became executive director of the Society for Humanistic Judaism. I'm proud that I was part of that process. For nearly two decades, Paul has dedicated his life to helping Jewish organizations and movement, movements better understand what's happening in our Jewish community, whether it's intermarriage, engagement, disaffiliation, inclusion. He was for many years the associate director of Big Tent Judaism, Jewish Outreach Institute, and there he helped pioneer and refine many effective engagement techniques that he's brought to our movement through his incredible vision and his talents. He has been tireless in working for our movement, including the establishment, as we heard those were, of us who were in the room earlier, of the Jews for a secular democracy. Earlier this evening, Rachel Lazar was recognized as the first recipient of the Constitutional Defender Award. And I am proud to invite Paul up to tell us more about Rachel as we continue our evening together. Please welcome Paul Golden. Shabbat Shalom. I'm now going to introduce the real introducer. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know I was getting the whole thing. That's great. Uh, it's an honor for me to introduce Rachel Lazar, President and CEO of Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Americans United is an organization that I'm proud to be a member of, and that frankly I think all humanistic Jews and really all Jews should support, and here's why. So many of the societal issues we care about today directly relate to defending the wall between government and religion from LGBTQ equality to reproductive rights to even climate change policy. And I'll let Rachel speak more about the specifics, but what I want to share is humanistic Judaism's connection to it. Humanistic Jews are a double minority. As Jews, we are part of a minority religious group. Only about 2% of Americans identify as Jewish. And as openly secular Americans, we are part of another minority, although a growing minority, Polls find that about a quarter of all Americans now don't identify with a religion. And that's a significant increase from just a decade ago. Of course, not being affiliated with a religion doesn't automatically mean secular, but it suggests secular Americans are increasing. But it's still easier to be openly secular within the Jewish community than in the wider American society. Secular Americans have almost no representation in Congress, and openly secular people experience discrimination that seems to be on the rise. As recently as last week, the Court of Appeals in, in Washington, D.C. ruled that the chaplain of the U.S. House of Representatives can continue to bar atheists from delivering invocations. And yes, there's a chaplain of the U.S. House of Representatives. It's your tax dollars at work. When I started at the Society for Humanistic Judaism, I surveyed the excellent community service and social justice work already happening throughout the movement. 
And I realize that on many, if not most issues, humanistic Jews are far from united. So on gun control, it is not controversial in some of our communities and in other communities we don't talk about gun control. And on Israel, ha! <laughs> We've got a, as wide a diversity of opinions on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as Israelis and Palestinians. <laughs> but where I found near unanimous support is in the call for enforcing separation of religion and government as provided for in the US Constitution. So to raise up our movement's efforts, last year we launched the new initiative that was just mentioned, Jews for a Secular Democracy. It is a pluralistic initiative for all Jews and friends and family to advocate for government neutral toward all or no religion from a specifically Jewish perspective. <laughs> but before we launched publicly, I called Rachel at American, Americans United to let her know about it and that we see this initiative as totally complementary <laughs> to their work. And despite only having just begun at AU a few months earlier, Rachel was kind enough to spend time talking with me about it. She totally got it and was supportive of our efforts. Uh, as Jews, as secular humanists, I feel it's imperative to support the work of Americans United. And in fact, we have several leaders in our movement who are also deeply involved in AU's work. And that's the great thing about doing good. It's not a zero-sum game. For example, I'm a member of my local Humanistic Judaism congregation, and I support the Society for Humanistic Judaism, and I'm a member of Americans United, and I would never tell you what to do, <laughs> but you should all do that too. It's been so impressive to watch from afar as Rachel has stepped up to the leadership role at Americans United at a time when the work of defending the separation of church and state has never been harder or more important. It's why earlier tonight the Society for Humanistic Judaism awarded Rachel with the inaugural Jews for a Secular Do Democracy Constitutional Defender Award. Before Rachel became president and CEO at Americans United for Separation of Church and State, she served as the deputy director of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, which is another really fantastic organization. Before that, she directed the cultural program at Third Way, a Washington DC based progressive think tank. She's a lawyer, advocate, and strategist who has dedicated her career to making our country more inclusive. Please welcome Rachel Lassen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. I would like to start by reading you a quote. The right to believe or not believe is the most fundamental of freedoms. When religious liberty is denied or destroyed, we know that other freedoms, freedom of speech, of press, of assembly, and even democratic institutions themselves are imperiled. I know this is a tough one, but does anyone want to hazard a guess about who might have said this? Felix Frankfurter. Okay, no, but good guess. Anyone else? Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, no, but he could have. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Not even Alexander Hamilton. These are Vice President Pence's remarks. <laughs> at the U.S. State Department's Ministerial to Advance Religious Freedom from last July. These words sound fine, right? He's recognizing non-theists, he's acknowledging the importance of religious freedom to democracy. We agree. Less surprising is how Pence's speech ends with a declaration that belief in God is what gives America freedom. Quote, for as the Bible tells us, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So freedom always wins when faith in him is held high. May God bless you and your nations, and may God bless the United States of America. 
The story I want to tell tonight is about the clever strategy that the religious right and the highest level government officials are using to co-opt the term religious freedom to advance their political agenda. It's about the rhetoric not matching the reality. It's an ugly story about the politicization of one of America's most sacred principles and the use of it to discriminate and hurt people. And it's a story about a grave threat to true religious freedom for all Americans. First, because it's so easy to take it for granted and misunderstood in today's political climate, I'll spend a little time reminding us why religious freedom is such an essential right and why you can't have it without the separation of religion and government. Then I'll describe how religious freedom today is under attack and what's worse, how it's being misused to undermine true religious freedom. And finally, I'll talk about the national movement we need to build in order to safeguard religious freedom for generations to come and how you can be part of it. And you already have started with this wonderful project. But let's start with the basics. Because thanks to all the misinformation spread by leaders like Vice President Pence, everyone living in America today could use a refresher about what true religious freedom is and just how core it is to our country. First, a short history lesson. Historians, as well as Supreme Court justices, widely regard the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom as the foundation of how the framers of the Constitution and First Amendment approached matters of religion and government. Thomas Jefferson drafted the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom in 1777 to protect those who deviated or dissented from the state-sanctioned Anglican Church at that time. It became law in 1785 thanks to the efforts of Jefferson's friend and political ally, James Madison. It's hard to believe that Virginia actually required its citizens to attend Sunday Church of England church services, isn't it? <laughs> Journalist Frederick Clarkson notes that failure to attend services was the most prosecuted crime in Virginia for many years. But with the passage of the Virginia statute, people were no longer required to worship at a state church. Jefferson emphasized that the aim of this statute was to protect, quote, the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian and Mahometan, the Hindu and the infidel of every denomination. <laughs> Take a minute to think about how radical that idea was in 1785. But it's also important to understand that it wasn't entirely selfless. Jefferson includes the Gentile and the Christian in his list of who the religious freedom law was designed to protect. Back in that day, it was well understood that religious freedom was key to protecting and even strengthening all beliefs, including mainstream Christianity. As Roger Williams, the Baptist theologian who founded Rhode Island in 1636 as the first colony with separation of church and state, famously said, forced worship stinks in the nostrils of God. <laughs> in other words, religious freedom allows people to come to their beliefs themselves instead of being coerced, and our founders got that. So religion, religious freedom exists to protect all of us. Here's what I think religious freedom means. We all should have the freedom to be religious, not to be religious, to change our belief system over the course of our lifetime, or to practice whatever religion we want in whatever way we want, so long as we aren't harming others. Religious freedom recognizes that our choices around religion are so deeply personal that for many of us, they shape our core identities and at least one of our core communities. 
It acknowledges that people's religious or non-religious identities can be so powerful that some are even willing to die to preserve them. Religious freedom is key to America's commitment to diversity. In this case, our embrace of the thousands of religions practiced across our shores. America would not be America without it. I will add that for me personally as a Jew, as I imagine for many of you too, America's commitment to religious freedom is crucial to feeling secure. It gives me and my family a feeling of equal belonging and affords us equal opportunity. It has enabled me to do so many things that I take for granted. Basic things like sending my kids to public school without fearing that they will be taught a religion that is not our families, raising my kids to be part of a Jewish community among other communities, and being eligible for even the highest level of government jobs just like my Christian neighbors. America's commitment to religious freedom also enabled my relatives, as I imagine many of yours, to flee religious persecution rebuild their lives here, and even thrive. And let's also pause to remember that separating religion and government is the linchpin of religious freedom. When the Founding Fathers wrote the First Amendment, they baked church-state separation right into it. Sheila read earlier, actually, from Jefferson's letter in 1802 to the Danbury Baptists but I'll read it again. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should quote, First Amendment, make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. As you just heard, the First Amendment has two religion clauses the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause, and they work together to protect religious freedom. The Establishment Clause, which is really about the government not establishing religion, puts limits on the Free Exercise Clause. No one can exercise their religion such that they're using the government's power to impose their religion on the rest of us. The Establishment Clause prohibits the government from endorsing or disparaging any one religion over another or religion over non-religion in order to protect your and my religious freedom. I hope you'll agree with me that religious freedom and church-state separation should be a priority for all of us, but if you need more convincing, allow me to paint a grim picture about how the religious right in partnership with the Trump-Pence administration is tearing down the wall separating religion and government and misusing our cherished principle of religious freedom to advance a regressive social and political agenda that actually undermines your and my religious freedom. A few weeks ago, I met with a group of college students from Stanford who were on a spring break trip in DC studying religion and politics. I posed the following question to the room. When you think about religious freedom, what comes to mind? Right out of the gate, one student responded, homophobia. There was soon a consensus in the room. Rather than the lofty ideals I spoke of earlier, like freedom and diversity, this group of college students associates religious freedom with discrimination against LGBTQ people. How sad, right? But they're not crazy to think this. Here's a true story to illustrate why. Amy Madonna lives in Simpsonville, South Carolina with her husband and three kids, two of whom are autistic. Sitting in her living room earlier this year, I witnessed firsthand what a patient and devoted mom she is. Amy's dad grew up in the foster care system at a time when foster parents weren't well vetted, and he had a rough time. 
As an adult, he wanted to provide foster kids with a better experience than he had had, and he welcomed hundreds of the most vulnerable foster kids into his home, providing Amy with many brothers and sisters, some for just a few days, some for months or longer. Now Amy wants to teach her kids the same values and provide a loving family experience for a new generation of foster kids. Since her children have special needs, her and her husband's plan was first to volunteer with foster kids so that they could ensure they were a good fit before officially fostering. Amy knew Miracle Hill Ministries was the largest and most advertised foster care agency in her community and that they allowed both adults and children to volunteer. She felt it would be the perfect arrangement. Miracle Hill felt the same way until they learned that Amy is Catholic. At that point they told her, I'm sorry, we only allow volunteers and mentors who are quote, Protestant Christians. It turns out that Miracle Hill, which receives 600,000 of our federal and state taxpayer money every year, serves only evangelical Protestants. It's not just Amy who they've rejected. Miracle Hill has also denied two Jewish couples the ability to volunteer, even though they, like Amy, were highly qualified. When the South Carolina governor, Henry McMaster, and the Trump administration found out about what was going on, rather than denouncing this government-funded discrimination, they doubled down. Governor McMaster issued an executive order specifically to allow state-funded foster care agencies to reject prospective parents who don't share their religion. Then, on January 23rd, the day after the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, January 22nd, 1973, no, not a coincidence, the Trump-Pence administration announced it too would allow all South Carolina foster agencies to refuse to work with anyone they deem the wrong religion, granting them an explicit exemption from federal anti-discrimination regulations. Unbelievably, the Trump administration's stated basis for licensing religious discrimination is the, quote, religious freedom rights of Miracle Hill and other faith-based foster care agencies. This is why those Stanford kids aren't wrong when they say religious freedom is about discrimination these days. In February, my organization, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, filed a lawsuit in federal court on behalf of Amy Madonna to stop the federal government and South Carolina from authorizing and encouraging discrimination with taxpayer dollars. The lawsuit, called Madonna versus United States Department of Health and Human <laughs> Services, alleges that permitting governmental discrimination based on religion violates the First Amendment's religious freedom protections. When the government gives special religious exemptions and, <clears throat> excuse me, when the government gives special religious exemptions and our taxpayer money to Miracle Hill, they're endorsing Miracle Hill's religious discrimination. The government should never be in the business of endorsing the belief that only evangelical Protestants can make good foster parents. And the government should not sanction the use of religion to cause harm to others, because forcing someone to bear the cost of someone else's religion is giving special treatment to one set of religious beliefs over others. At Americans United, we like to say it this way. Religious freedom should be a shield that protects people, not a sword to harm others and discriminate. In this case, the government is misusing religious freedom to cause unmistakable and grave harm on so many fronts. There's harm to prospective parents like Amy who are being discriminated against and turned away based solely on being the wrong religion. There's harm to the more than 
5,000 kids in foster care in South Carolina who have a lesser chance of finding a permanent home. And there's harm to the kids placed by these agencies in homes where evangelical Christianity is imposed on them whether they share the faith or not. And let's not leave out the harm to you and me because our tax money pays for this. I know I'm preaching to the choir when I tell you that President Trump and Vice President Pence are pandering to far-right evangelical Christians and their political agenda because they form the base of their voting bloc. It's clear from the data, Trump maintains around a 70% approval rating among white evangelicals, which is nearly 20 points higher than among any other religious group. As Trump told a group of conservative evangelical Christians he invited to the White House last summer for a dinner in their honor, quote, the support you've given me has been incredible, but I really don't feel guilty because I have given you a lot back, just about everything I promised. And as one of our great pastors just said, actually, you've given us much more, sir, than you promised. And I think that's true in many respects. <laughs> Thus, not surprisingly, so many of his actions that Trump labels, labels as being about protecting religious freedom are really about elevating one narrow fundamentalist interpretation of Christianity and misusing religious freedom to harm others, usually people on the LGBTQ community and women. To name just two more of countless examples, in January, the Trump administration released a final rule allowing all bosses and universities to deny women access to birth control, promise them under the Affordable Care Act, if they have a religious or moral objection. We have sued the Trump administration and Notre Dame to challenge this rule. Any day now, this is the second one, look out for this one. The Department of Health and Human Services is supposed to release a final regulation that would allow anyone associated with the healthcare system doctors, healthcare workers, hospitals, and anyone working at them, including receptionists and janitors, to refuse to participate in any healthcare for which they have a moral or religious objection. This would include life-saving services, like ending an ectopic pregnancy. This rule could even allow a doctor to attempt to deny fertility treatments to an interfaith couple, or a nurse to refuse to treat a transgender patient who has the flu. We're prepared to take action. And this is not just happening in the administration. There's also a full frontal campaign taking place in state legislatures across the country to codify a far-right evangelical Christian nation and allow discrimination in the name of religious freedom. And it's called Project Blitz. Backed by three religious right groups, Project Blitz's strategy is to pass an increasingly ambitious set of laws in states, starting with ones that are harder to prevent from going through, like requiring prominently displaying in God we trust in public schools and teaching Bible classes in public schools and eventually escalating to laws that would permit religion to be used to discriminate. Project Blitz's 150-page playbook, replete with 21 model bills, strategy, and messaging guidance, was distributed to more than 800 state legislators across America in 2018. So together, Trump, Pence, and their emboldened allies are weaponizing religious freedom and turning what is supposed to be a shield that protects us into a sword that harms people and stops social progress. And it is robbing you and me of our religious freedom. Is your blood pressure elevated yet? <laughs> it should be. The million dollar question is what can we do about this? Americans United's board and senior staff have
spent this past year thinking hard about this question. And I'm excited to share some of our thinking here publicly for the first time. We know what we want. In America where every, this is from our vision statement, in America where everyone can freely choose a faith and support it voluntarily or follow no religious or spiritual path at all and where the government does not promote religion over non-religion or favor one faith over another. In this America, the government is never in the business of imposing one set of religious beliefs on the rest of us or giving special privileges to any one religion or allowing religion to be used to nullify protections for vulnerable communities of people and to stop America's progress towards achieving our ideals. We know that the clock is ticking with the opposition chipping away at our freedom every day in our private lives, workplaces, schools, government, services, and healthcare systems. But too few Americans know or think about what religious freedom is and actually understand how foundational it is to all of our lives and to our country. And similarly, not enough Americans are aware of the extent to which church-state separation is under attack today. So the answer is, we have to make more noise. We have to remind people about the importance of church-state separation, take back the meaning of true religious freedom, become more visible, and ignite a national movement that insists on separating religion and government. Yes, we need to continue to sue in court, and to shape public policy in Congress and across the states, and Americans United will never stop doing this with your help. But we must make sure that we are also inspiring younger people who are tirelessly and passionately fighting for the future of our country and who need to put church-state separation at the top of their priority list. And to do this, we must connect the dots between church-state separation and other key issues that they care about, like racial justice, LGBTQ equality, reproductive freedom, climate change, et cetera. And to succeed in building a national movement, we know we need to broaden and diversify our supporters. In addition to targeting younger adults, we must do a better job of reaching people of color who will soon be a majority in this country. We will build black and brown allies in our youth-focused work and also when we strengthen our already extensive ties to the religious community. We heard earlier the religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, are growing in America and they will always form a crucial block of our supporters. At the same time, with 70% of the country still identifying as Christian, we need to continue to build Christian allies alongside our religious minority ones and bring Christians, religious minorities, and the non-religious together to advocate for church-state separation. And I'm really proud to say that just a few months ago, uh, I got the president of the National Council of Churches, which is an umbrella group for 38 different Christian denominations, to join the board of Americans United for Separation of Church and State. We must not let our opponents' false claim that we are anti-religion continue to cost us support or scare our faith allies away from proudly standing with us. We know that church-state separation is good for religion and many religious people agree. So that we are speaking in the most effective ways to these different audiences, Americans United will conduct our first ever public opinion research. This research will give us insights into what modern day messages work to reach the people we must mobilize. Americans United plans to start fortifying our national movement by creating state networks in 20 states over the next five years. 
Our state networks will engage supporters and young people with digital advocacy and offer them a ladder of engagement. Because if we know one thing already, it's that, and look around, younger Americans are not big joiners. So we will test strategies to build these modern day networks as we go. In the end, we know we will prevail because we are fighting on the side of American values like freedom, diversity, equality, respect, and even patriotism. But we know we also have a secret ingredient that our opponents do not. And quite frankly, it's you. Folks like you who get our issue so intuitively have been and will continue to be the bedrock of the movement we will grow and strengthen. So if you haven't already, please do join Americans United and get your friends to do the same. You will be supporting important lawsuits like the Amy Madonna one, critical proactive and defensive work in Congress and state legislatures, and the movement building we will be engaging in over these next five years and beyond. You will also get our awesome magazine with a personal column from me each month. <laughs> we will plug you into taking action in your state and federally and keep you up to speed on developments. And if you aren't a joiner, then as a start, please consider following us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, at Americans United. We need you to help lay the bricks for this movement from the ground up in any way you can. The truth is, each of us can use our voice and be effective advocates in ways that we are most comfortable and uniquely positioned to do. And we all need to make an effort to take this issue out of the realm of the strictly abstract and make it more personal and human, like the Amy Madonna story does. To that end, please indulge me one final time. Could everyone here please take a moment to think about why religious freedom and separating religion and government is important to you? Maybe you have a personal story of your own to share or one to tell about a family member. Perhaps you have thoughts about why religious freedom is important to you as a humanistic or secular Jew or as an American Jew or just as a Jew or perhaps just as an American. And when you're ready, Turn to your neighbor or neighbors and share your story. Practice, practice making noise, and then give your neighbor a few minutes to tell you why religious freedom is important to them. And after that, we'll open it up to questions. So thanks again for the honor of receiving the award and being with you. adoption agencies could use freedom of religion as a way to deny LGBTQ uh, families who wanted to adopt. In November, we had an election here, and we got a new attorney general who was an attorney who had won the same sex case in the, in the U.S. Supreme Court, Dana Nessel. And one of the first things that she has gone after is this unfair, unconstitutional law. And she is now being accused of being 
anti-Catholic. <laughs> so this is, you know, using it as a sword. And you tell the Amy Madonna story to yeah. anyone who says that. Yeah. We have a question over here. Hi, Rachel. Really great to hear what the AU is doing. Um, we had worked with them in Seattle and really had a good experience. And I'm really glad to hear about the work that you're doing to expand the movement. And the question that I have is there are other organizations like Secular Coalition of America, Society, there's, there's many others. How is that movement being collaborated so that we are working lockstep with each other? Because we're going to be stronger together, just yeah. like you're yeah. with the Church of Council. Agreed, agreed. So one of the most exciting things that I've gotten to do since I started at Americans United was when we first learned about Project Blitz, which was really just, you know, I've been there a year and change. Really just like a year ago, right away, Frederick Clarkson broke the story about Project Blitz. No one knew, it was totally under the radar. Um, and, you know, the question was, what should we do? And clearly the thing to do is to form the broad coalition of Americans United for separation of church and state to fight this Christian nationalist effort. And so in our conference room, it was so exciting at Americans United, we brought everyone together, the broadest space coalition. Here's who was sitting in our conference room. Secular Coalition for America, American Atheists, National Council of Churches, the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, the Methodists, ACLU, NARAL Pro-Choice America, the Human Rights Campaign, the National Women's Law Center, and some of the religious minority denominations as well. Everyone came together to say, we all have a stake in this battle. And we formed a couple of things. We formed two listservs so that we keep everyone informed in this coalition, so that we can all use our voices together. And the other thing that we did, which is really powerful for lobbying in state legislatures on these Project Blitz bills, is we created a sign-on letter that was meant to show, and it pointed out that these these first stage Project Blitz bills that you all would obviously recognize as being problematic, but a lot of you know progressives don't, like in God We Trust in schools and Bible classes, are part of a larger Christian nationalism effort, and here's what it looks like, and here's who's behind it, and this is signed by everyone in that room, all of those groups. So now our advocates like you can bring that letter to state legislators and say, look, who's opposed to this, all of these, all of us. So that is just one example, but we work together all the time. Yeah, really important. Both of us, yeah. Hi, I was just, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't realize it was so loud. Um, I was just wondering if you've done any outreach to um, I don't know, military generals or anyone in the military at all, because I feel like in some way, um, a lot of the groundswell of this sentiment really comes from, not, I don't know if it's the military itself and sort of the indoctrination that happens there, or if it's just who it tends to attract, the regions of the country who tend to join and who then go out and carry out the sort of indoctrinated message that they've gotten in their four plus years there. What What is the entry point for influencing that in some way? It's got a name. Mikey Weinstein runs a group called the Military Religious Freedom Blank. I just, I get emails from him every day, speak to him, just spoke to him last week. We're gonna get together in Washington. He came for the Bladensburg Cross oral argument before the Supreme Court. Now, his group spends a lot of time defending religious minorities who serve, right? And the reason he had to start that group is he, he actually used to work with Americans United, not officially, but do a lot of work as a volunteer with us. And he noticed that there was just an overwhelming, to your point, number of cases that they had to deal with. So he even started a, you know, a group that we work very closely with. So that, I would say Mikey Weinstein's group is like taking the lead and doing that work, but we're working very closely with him. We have a question over here, Ed. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that there is legislation that says government should not pass any legislation that would infringe on the practice of religion. So on that basis, okay, okay if you endorse the idea that I have to bake a cake for anybody who comes into the door, um, 
my religion says, no, I don't have to and I shouldn't have to do that. That's a trivial example. But how about if a physician finds abortion abhorrent and uh, you're going to, in a, in a way, insist that he engage in abortion or terminate a pregnancy, even though it goes to his very a kernel of his moral beliefs. I, I, I mean, I think that that's, you, you painted a picture, you've given us the view, there's nothing that you said that I object to, but I do think that there are some limits to uh, freedom. But look, th this is a very complex area, I agree. I will say this though, that a distinction that I would make is no one really wants a doctor to operate on them who is vehemently opposed to what they're gonna do. I mean, there are medical and safety concerns that are involved in that case versus if you're turning away people from getting wedding cakes based on their sexual orientation. When you live in a state that has passed an anti-discrimination law specifically to protect LGBTQ people and couples, then if the government is giving you an exemption from that law, they are giving you and your religion special privileges. So that is unacceptable. Uh, my name is Doug Marshall. I'm director of the Reason Station in the Lord Michigan City Hall. First, I'd like to thank Americans United for the legal help on getting me into the Warren City Hall. I appreciate that. <laughs> but secondly, I'm here to make a little noise. This next Thursday, May 2nd, is the National Day of Prayer. The City of Warren is having a gigantic event. I would like to invite everyone in the congregation to come to the Warren City Hall for 12 uh, noon next Thursday, May 2nd, and make a sign on separation of church and state to let the city know that not everybody agrees uh, in prayer. Thank you. Lots of efforts happening locally. I know we have a question from over here. Uh, I'm Joel Brown. Uh, question. Have you contacted the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, on this issue? In about a million and a quarter of Oh, did you say If I didn't, I should have. Yeah, we work with them all. The ACLU was in the room on Project Blitz. I did mention that. But yes, they are our partners in crime constantly. Constantly. Okay, Renee. Can you talk a little bit about the role of the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, please? <laughs> the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, and in fact, the uh, Union of Orthodox Jews, as represented by Nathan Diamond in Washington, is the only denomination of Judaism that sides not always, but pretty consistently with the religious right these days. It is just true, and I can't believe it, because to me it feels so short-sighted. Like, I know that there's concerns about their schools having money and et cetera, but in the end, at the end of the day, if you tear down the wall between church and state, it's exactly the church that's going to take over in this country. So it's bewildering to me. Bewildering. Um, we have time for one last question. Oh, yeah. It's about the splits. Is there some way, I don't know if it's your list or whatever, but some way that we here in Michigan could be informed if something's coming up in our legislature so that we need to take action? I promise you that if you join Americans United, I promise you we will be keeping you informed. That's exactly one of the things that we do. I'm not say AmericansUnited.org? AU.org. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Rachel's going to be hanging around for the ONX Shabbat. You'll have plenty of opportunities to speak to her. Uh, we're going to conclude now with Od Yavo Shalom. And uh, I want to especially thank Ezra Donner, our music director, a big hand for him. And thank you all for being here tonight for this wonderful celebration. Thank you.